If you were to put the Mark Shapiro hat on... I don't want to put it on. <laughs> well, Ron Shapiro, welcome to Every Conversation Counts. Uh, you, I can't tell you what a joy it is to be here, Riaz. You know, the art of negotiation stands out, and there was one statement that, uh, that came uh, out of your mouth that I thought you would be the perfect subject for this series, and it was, it's not about the sale, it's the relationship that counts. You know, early in my career, <clears throat> when I moved from sports, I stayed in sports, but I put the emphasis on negotiation. I trained people in the world of business development and sales. And one day a salesman walked up to me and he tapped me on the shoulder. His name was Joe Gaddy. And he said, Ron, let me tell you, I got it. I said, what's that, Joe? It's not the sale. It's the relationship that counts. Well, that applies to sales. That applies to sports. That applies to politics, business, the world. So it's very, very important. So when you're building the bond with someone, someone that you're meeting for the first time, where do you put your focus first to build that relationship? Well, you know, the f I always know what I want in a negotiation. I put the focus on them. I put the focus on them in terms of trying to ascertain what their needs and wants are. Now, I may not give them everything they want, but I want to understand that. I play listener. I ask questions and listen. A lot of people think the great negotiators, like we hear the politicians, I'll show them, I'll tell them what's up. No, it's I'll listen to them and I'll learn what's up. And by listening, you gain valuable information, but you also convey to someone that you care and the relationship begins to form. All about the act of listening. And I've watched, I've read the books, I've seen uh, the methods that we're gonna get into. But how do you gain access to someone? Because some people, the idea of vulnerability and us as, as, a, as a thought leader embracing imperfection I think is important. But if someone doesn't want to share and they're closed off, how do you get them to open up and be vulnerable with you? I, you know, I do all the research I can on them. <clears throat> In my book, The Power of Nice, I have, there's a wonderful introduction or forward to the book written by Ambassador Charlene Barshevsky. She was the person who negotiated world trade, free trade with China for the United States. And she talked about doing research and understanding what made the lead Chinese negotiator tick, what his hobbies were, what he liked. Well, when I was in the sports world, I had a general manager in baseball who had no interest in talking to me. He hated agents. And I did research. And do you know what I discovered? I discovered that he liked roses. And I saw roses in pictures in his office. And I said, I'll use his name, Herc, I see. You, grow ro you have roses up here. Do you grow roses? Oh, yeah, Ron. Well, that's a double delight. And I said, I grow double delight. And soon we were talking about fungicides, pesticides, and how to grow roses. A relationship started to be built because it wasn't going to be built over his view of agents and sports. So getting personal by looking at the artifacts, and I like the idea of going to their venue, their office, and observe what is happening. Or with the wonder of technology today, you can go to the internet. It's amazing what you can find out, and you can call someone, and you can, you went to this college, you, did, you love this, you love that, and share something, because sharing is what is the common bond that brings us human beings together. Too often in this world, we're looking for the division point. I look for the connection point. You mentioned the sports world, and the great thing about your career is some of the players you had the chance to represent. Kirby Puckett, Joe Maurer, Hall of Famer, Cal Ripken Jr. But for Cal Ripken Jr., I thought this was fascinating. You represent a player for his entire career. How did you build the bond with Cal even before the negotiation that you were going to represent him? Well, you know, it's interesting. His, his dad was a coach on the Orioles. Through time, I w and, and I came into the representation of players totally by mistake. I'm an agent by accident. <clears throat> the Orioles had asked me to represent Brooks Robinson. We can talk about that later. But Cal Sr. would observe me with various players who had asked me to help them. And I think, number one, he recommended me to Cal. But I was no competition for the agents in New York who put him in limousines and took him to supper clubs and the agents in California who took him to movie studios. In my book, The Power of Nice, he wrote a foreword, and he wrote how I brought him to my office, put him at a little wooden table, and gave him a tuna fish sandwich. And he said because of that, he decided I should be his agent. And it was a values alignment. It wasn't about how fancy you could be or you know, how top of the line you could be perceived. It was about doing things in a basic way. So it was good luck again, good fortune. And sometimes it's just getting back to basics. B basics are so important. You know, 
Be yourself. Be yourself. What happens in the world of entertainment and the world of sports is people think they have to act like they think people want them to act. Well, as soon as you're acting like that, you're not yourself. And you're going to be discovered. You may get the connection. You may get the client. But it's not going to last. So you want an alignment of values. So I want to hit on this notion of values nope. that, that you mentioned. And if anybody's watching this and thinking, I'm in a position in my life where I want to ask for a raise, or I, I, I got to put out a big contract and try and convince a client that I'm the right person for the job, a lot of uh, ideas and approaches that you have, what are the keys to perfecting the pitch to get your message heard and have it win? Well, you know, they're, uh, perfecting the pitch is one piece of practicing the power of nice, which is a negotiation skill. And I'll, I'll just give you the highlights, okay? Prepare like anything. Dig in. I, I, I created a preparation checklist a long time ago. You know, pilots know how to fly planes, but they always go over a checklist. Negotiators think they know how to negotiate, but there's a checklist of information you want to get. What's the most and, important part of preparation? Uh, gathering information about the interests of the other side, which isn't how much money they want. It's what else motivates them in life, and looking at precedents, how they've dealt in the past, understanding what motivates them and how they act in situations like this. So that's the most important part, but there are actually seven or eight points in the checklist. The next thing, and notice how it's all about information gathering, is called probe. Three Ps, prepare, probe, propose. The second P is probe, ask questions and listen. We all have an inclination to gather information and then say, Riaz, I'll tell you what, I really think I deserve a raise because I've impacted or I think I deserve this business because I can give you a big return. No, stop. Gather more information. Learn about them. Further the connection with them. And then propose. And propose is based on various principles about aiming high maybe or aiming low as the case may be. But the most important thing in propose is the subject of my latest book called Perfecting Your Pitch, How to Find the Words to Succeed in Life and Business. And what's that all about? Sometimes we know what we want, we think we know how to get there, but as soon as we sit opposite the other side, we clam up with fear. We fear rejection. We're concerned that they may not hear it the right way. And so I say, you know, put everything down, draft it, give it to a devil's advocate, let them rip it apart and then practice delivery and ultimately deliver it. But the key is this. You know, understand that the key to success in life is have a good philosophy, and I haven't gone into that yet, and then have a systematic approach. The philosophy is, in order to get what you want in life, help other people get what they want. So let's say we're in the situation where you've done your homework. You were fully prepared, you've practiced, you, you've got your devil's advocate, and you get to the table and you've got someone with the bully mentality, the egomaniac that wants to make this difficult, that sees it as a battle. How do you access that person so you move from competition to collaboration? Neutralize your emotions. Don't take it personally and don't get personal. If you get pulled into the vortex of anger and aggressiveness that the other side has, you don't have a chance. Think about it in your personal life. If your spouse, your significant other, your you have a fight, and one side starts and then you counterpunch, it's gone. So neutralize your emotions. And, and I find that by neutralizing my emotions and then asking questions and listening, letting them have the stage, that sooner or later, most of the time, not all of the time, I'm able to move them off of that aggressive pitch into a more collaborative pitch. And it's such a fine balance because I, I, this power of nice is something that uh, I relate to. I agree with this perspective. And I also have some people come to me that say, hey, Riaz, you're, you're too nice. If you are in a time of conflict and a dominant leader is needed to take charge and take the reins and lead the team, how do you draw the line between being effectively assertive versus being overly aggressive? Well, look, I, I live in the real world. You know, I know there are terrorist organizations like ISIS, and I doubt that I could sit down and negotiate with the power of nice with them. In fact, I doubt that I could negotiate with them what I would have to do then is turn to a, a more aggressive approach. However, I look at the total situation and I look at who I can negotiate with who will ally themselves with me so that we can confine the impact of what that particular organization does. There are so many great learning lessons about this notion of neutralizing your emotions. 
from all of the negotiations that you have had, is there a conversation that stands out to you that defined why you love the art of negotiation and defined your style behind this philosophy of the power uh, of nice? You know, I, <clears throat> I think there are people who, who stand out more than, more than a, a discussion. I, I will give you an example of a negotiation, and that was my first sports negotiation. I, I, was, I had been securities commissioner of Maryland. I had negotiated with big investment types. Um, I had negotiated in the civil rights arena because I desegregated housing in Maryland. <clears throat> but my first sports negotiation, I represented a Hall of Famer named Brooks Robinson. I had helped him out of terrible financial messes. He asked me to negotiate his last baseball contract. The Orioles had given him the maximum cut in his last year, 20%. And I went into the Orioles' general manager, who became my best friend over time, and I made the greatest case for Brooks Robinson in the world. I was so excited with all the research I did and everything I did. And I finished the negotiation, and I looked at Hank Peters, who was the general manager. I said, Hank, you see, you see why you not only shouldn't cut him 20%, you should give him a 5% raise. I was so convinced myself, and Hank looked at me and said, Ron, I'll get back to you. I'll get back to you? What did I learn? I learned that I gave him everything. I didn't ask a question. And that was the turning point where I learned from Hank Peters the power of effective listening the power of spending some time analyzing what the other side says and then getting back to them. So that, that was a pivotal point in terms of technique of negotiation. Philosophy of negotiation, my dad was a, 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 an immigrant from the Ukraine. He was pulled out of school in the seventh grade to help support a family in the United States. At the end of his education, what did he do? He sold newspapers and encyclopedias. What else did he do? He read those newspapers and encyclopedias. What happened? By the time he was 20 years old, people thought he had six degrees. I mean, he read himself through his job. What was the philosophy I learned? The glass is always half full. No matter how dark it looks, you know, there's a way out and there's a way to do things. And so he taught me so much at that point in time. And then the other thing he taught me, which I hopefully have passed to the next generation is that every human being is valuable because he did go into business one day, he did succeed, and he would walk down the street and whether it was you know, the guy driving the truck or loading the truck or the chairman of the board, everyone got a hello, everyone was treated well, and he genuinely felt that way. So that, those two things, you put those together and that makes me the negotiator I am. I wanna kinda get along with people, I wanna value people, and I wanna kinda get a result that leads to believing that the glass half full can take you to a nice full point. This message of making people feel valuable, I'm happy you brought it up because you talk about the next generation, you have seven kids. Seven. One, one of your children, being Mark Shapiro, president of the Blue Jays, who we featured here on Every Conversation Counts, and he was talking about one of the greatest lessons he learned from his father was this notion of respecting every individual he comes across. So now when you look at, at the role he's in and what he's accomplished in his career, what do you look back at as the pivotal conversation, father-son moment with you and Mark, and what stands out? Well, let me, can I digress again and then maybe get to that? Yeah. The, the pivotal moment for me was a conversation about Mark, okay? I'm walking in the Cleveland Stadium the year that they, they got into the, the playoffs, and, and he did a lot with a little there. There wasn't much financially there. And, but he loved the community, the community loved him. And I'm walking through the stadium, and I'd walk through earlier in the day, and this ticket taker taps me on the arm and he says, Mr. Shapiro, you know, you, I saw you earlier with Mark, uh, and I just want to tell you something. I want to tell you that your son, every single day, says hello to me. And he says hello to the guy who drives that cart over there, and he says hello to everybody in that stadium. You know, every one of us feels that, that he is for us as well as for those guys out on the field. That said to me, Ron, whatever you do in life, you've achieved what you wanted to achieve because he got the message that your father gave to him. Conversationally with Mark, the, probably the most important conversations come from what I've learned from Mark rather than what I told Mark. He'll tell you I taught him to pull weeds as a kid and I made him yeah, he stay did. there and not go to the game and just pull weeds, but uh, he had a job to do. But, uh, what I learned from Mark is, is that you, know, you can get a high-profile job like the presidency of a team, 
Um, and that, you know, a lot of people say, wow. In fact, the young lady, I checked in the hotel here in Toronto today. Your son's Mark Shapiro. You must be so proud. And I said, proud, but not because he's CEO of the Blue Jays or was with the Indians. Proud because he's a good man. And I can say that about all of my kids. And, and Mark said to me one day when things were rough here, when he first got to Toronto, they weren't easy. People did not want to change. And he was getting attacked from all sides. And I kept made the mistake of going online and reading the headlines and the letters and things like that in the paper. And, you know, I read and then I called Mark one day and I said, son, uh, you know, maybe this wasn't the best move in the world, even though I supported it. Um, and I'm sorry if you're, he said, dad, don't worry about me. My job is not my identity. My values are my identity. You taught me that. I'm fine. People are going to attack me because they're going to attack based on what they perceive. I am what I am. I'm going to do it right. Don't worry about me. That was the most important conversation I think I've ever had with Mark. Uh, plenty of ideas you've thrown out during this time. And if there was a way to kind of recap all of it, this notion of building relationships, what is your ultimate philosophy on how you make every conversation count? Make life count. That's really what's important. You know, I negotiate giant contracts. Mark negotiates giant contracts. But on the wall of my negotiations institute are words I want every player, every executive, every broadcaster, every human being I know uh, that I want them to, to think about. And they're words that came from Churchill. And they simply put, they are, uh, we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. And if more of us would learn that, the world could be a better place. Well, you've given us plenty. Ron Shapiro, thank you very much for this. Thank you. Very much. I think we need a spin-off. Every negotiation <laughs> counts. What do you think? Huh? I got it. <laughs> it's coming soon, people. It's coming soon. Hey, it's Riaz. Thanks for watching. For more conversations, click on subscribe and check us out online at everyconversationcounts.com.